Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, if you are here in person, welcome. If you're online, um, we have a lot of people joining us online this morning. Welcome to you. Uh, I am so delighted uh, that you all took the time to be here today. As I mentioned to you in my video this week, this is, for me, probably um, one of, if not the most important forum that we do um, this year because of how alive uh, this election is for all of us. Uh, I had people um, at the 8 a.m. service, after the service, telling me just how stressed uh, they are. And I'm like, I know, I feel this in my body. I'm carrying this right now. And so I had reached out to um, Adam Russell Taylor uh, and the crew at uh, Sojourners back in August. And I'd, I'd asked just one thing, is there a way that we could have a conversation about uh, Christian principles and the general election? Because we're hearing all kinds of stuff from all kinds of uh, uh, media sources. But what does our faith have to say about times like this? And I'm so grateful that um, Adam accepted the invitation uh, so graciously. So I'm going to introduce Adam to us. Um, Adam's going to speak for a while. And then he and I will um, sit on the stage. I'll ask a few questions to get us going. And then we'd love to hear um, some of your questions and comments as well. Um, so that's how the day will go. So uh, the Reverend Adam Russell Taylor is president of Sojourners and author of A More Perfect Union, A New Vision for Building the Beloved Community. And you'll remember that Adam was here back in the spring and, and we had a conversation on stage about, um, about his book. Uh, Taylor previously led the Faith Initiative at the World Bank Group and served as the vice president in charge of advocacy at World Vision U.S., and he's the, he was the senior uh, political director at, he is a senior political director at Sojourners. He's also served as the executive director of Global Justice, an organization that educates and mobilizes students around global human rights and economic justice. Uh, Adam was selected for the 2009-2010 class of White House Fellows and served in the White House Office of Cabinet Affairs and Public Engagement. Taylor is a graduate of Emory University the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. Taylor also serves on the Independent Sector Board, the Global Advisory Board of Tier Fund UK, and is a member of the inaugural class of the Aspen Institute Civil Society Fellowship. Taylor is ordained in the American Baptist Church and the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and he serves in ministry at the Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. So without further ado, let's welcome Adam. <clears throat> Thank you, Sari, for the kind introduction. It is really a joy and an honor to be back here at St. John's Episcopal Church to be with you on the eve of what it's not just arguably, I'm just going to say it, is the most consequential election, certainly in my lifetime. I won't presume that it is for yours, but would certainly argue that it, it probably is. I want to share some reflections, and I am not here to preach this morning, but I am a Black Baptist preacher, so I can't help but sometimes preach, and I can't help but think in alliteration. So I want to reflect a little bit about the role that we as Christians and we as the church broadly not only can play but need to play. And I believe that role is to be a balm, a beacon, and a bridge. Before I even get to that, though, let me say a couple things as a kind of disclaimer, if you will. One is that I am not here to tell you how to vote. I lead a nonpartisan organization, i.e. Sojourners. But I am here to try to get all of us to think more critically and more theologically about the very things that are at the heart of God and how we apply our faith to the messiness of our politics and to things like elections. So I am not shy about getting into policy issues and, and political issues, uh, but I just wanted to kind of say that up front. I also really want to make this a dialogue, so I, I will offer some introductory remarks. I'm really anxious to get into a conversation with your pastor and then ultimately with all of you. Real quick, though, how many of you are familiar with Sojourners as an organization? All right. So I've got a lot of friends in the house this morning. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, we are a Christian ecumenical organization, which means that we 
try to inspire and reach and mobilize Christians of all backgrounds and stripes, from mainline Protestant to evangelical to Catholic to black church and everyone in between. And our mission is to try to articulate the biblical call to justice and inspire people to put their faith into action for justice and peace. We have a publishing arm, which produces our magazine. We've got some copies up here. Hope that you'll grab one if you're not familiar with us. We also have a digital publication that produces even more content, and you can sign up for that at soja.net. And we have an advocacy and mobilizing arm, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our campaigns a little bit later in my talk. Uh, your pastor did mention my book, A More Perfect Union, A New Vision for Building the Beloved Community. I wish I could have brought more copies, but they're actually hard to find right now. And the good news in that is that my publisher just told me a couple weeks ago they're going to release the paperback version in April. So that is coming out soon. Um, you can certainly find it on Amazon and other places if you want to check out the book itself. And I do want to say for those of you that were able to join me for my talk, you'll, you'll certainly hear some pieces that may be familiar. So just you might hear it a second time. But how, how I kind of understand this moment in this election certainly is very much tied into my book itself, right? So first, for those of you that don't know much about my own background, I want to share a little bit about my own origin story. I was born very much in the shadow of the civil rights movement. My parents made the contra controversial decision to get married to each other in 1968, just a year after our nation legalized interracial marriage through the case Loving versus the state of Virginia. My mother is black, my father's white. They met in a PhD program at Ohio University. And my dad was actually my mom's statistics tutor. And they fell in love. And many people around them convinced them that it was not a good idea for them to get married. But they got married anyway. And one of the ironies is that some of their family members and even some of their friends used a reason for them not to get married, which is essentially my brother and I, that we would be hopelessly lost wouldn't have a clear racial identity if we came into the world. And the irony in that is that I feel like my biracial identity, and I do identify also as a black man, a proud black man, has enabled me to be a bridge builder in all kinds of ways, not just across race, but across other cleavages within our society. My parents instilled in me two deep and abiding beliefs. One is that my generation, Generation X, but I think this is true of millennials and Generation Z as well, that we inherited the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. And I became really mesmerized by the civil rights struggle and read as much as I could, fell in love with the Eyes and the Prize series, and really took that to heart. And I'll come back to that in a second. But the other core belief they instilled in me is that my diversity, but in a broader sense, our nation's diversity, is actually a strength and not a weakness. And you know, if you heard my talk last time, you probably remember that I'm a huge fan of the Marvel Universe. My dog is actually called Marvel. We couldn't agree on one Marvel character, so we just put it all in one dog. A lot of pressure on that dog, by the way. But I really, putting this in Marvel terms, believe that our nation's growing racial, religious, ethnic diversity is actually our superpower. Now I'm gonna flip to DC Comics. Throughout our history, there are many that have tried to convince us that it is actually a form of kryptonite, that that diversity is something to be feared, something to be even loathed. And I believe that struggle around how we understand who we, the people, includes is still at the core of our politics. It's not the only struggle, but it is one that is still a very defining one. I really kind of came to understand that core belief in the context of our faith as being connected to a commitment to Genesis 127, Imago Dei, that we are all made in the very image and likeness of God. And that means that we are all given inherent dignity. That inherent dignity is aligned with the creedal promise of this nation to ensure liberty and justice for all. It doesn't say for some, it doesn't say with exceptions, it says for all. I had the privilege of being on a bus tour, uh, I guess about two weeks ago, I'm losing track of time because I've been traveling a lot, but I, was, I joined an organization called Network Lobby, or Catholic Lobby, it's a, a Catholic peace and justice organization. And I don't know if you've ever heard of something called nuns on the bus, right? Now clearly I'm not a nun, I hope that's pretty obvious to you. 
But this year, they decided to do nuns on the bus and friends. And so I got to be a friend of the nuns. And I'm telling you, like, nuns are great friends to have. And it was a lot of fun, to be honest. It was exhausting. We literally, uh, so they, they broke up the tour into three segments. They had an East Coast tour, and then I got to join the Midwest tour. And I joined the bus in Pittsburgh. And then literally within about four or five days, we went all across the state of Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, and then ended up in Chicago for our, our last stop. And we did rallies, we did town hall forums, we visited organizations that were serving their communities. And what I loved about that tour is that nuns have a way of speaking with such moral clarity and such moral courage. And I don't know if you've ever been in an audience with a group of nuns, but they speak and people tend to listen. Like you can hear a pin drop oftentimes. And the, the kind of mantra of that tour was everyone thrives, no exceptions. That literally was our vision of everyone thriving. And of course, we broke it down much more than that. We talked about some of the core freedoms that are at stake in this election. The freedom to live in a healthy community, the freedom to be healthy ourselves, the freedom to live in a healthy, on a healthy planet, the freedom to be an active participant in a vibrant, inclusive democracy, and a lot more. And so I wanna remind all of us of the title of Dr. Martin Luther King's final book, you heard that I'm a big scholar and fan of the civil rights movement. He wrote a book toward the end of his life, didn't of course know that it was the end of his life, but about a, a year, year and a half before he was assassinated in 1968, he published a book called Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And one, I highly recommend you read the book if you've never read it, because it's quite prescient. I mean, he literally talks about so many issues that are still things we're grappling with today. Well, that title, I think, is an extremely provocative and timely one. And when I wrote my book, A More Perfect Union, I was really wrestling with a choice that I still think is very much in front of us. So my kind of remix of Dr. King's timeless question is where do we go from here? Toxic polarization or the beloved community? And I contrasted this kind of toxic form of polarization that we are mired in as a society and has also, I think, inflicted the church as well with this vision that animated the civil rights movement, this vision of equality, of nonviolence, of a commitment to agape love, a love that is selfless, that is unconditional. And in my book, I kind of give a, my own succinct remix of what the beloved community means for us today, which is to build a society, to build a nation where neither punishment or privilege is tied to race or ethnicity or to religion or to ableness or to sexual orientation, is to build a society and an America where everyone is equally valued, everyone is equally respected, where our diversity, growing diversity, is seen as a strength and not a weakness, and to build a society where everyone can thrive. Now, I know that's like a really big vision. It's meant to be, right? We need a big vision to inspire and unify us but it's also a very measurable vision. And maybe this is the, the Kennedy School government geek in me coming out. We can measure whether any public policy or budget decision or law either helps to exacerbate and reinforce the degree that punishment or privilege is tied to these different parts of our identity, or we can measure whether they actually help to reverse that, to dismantle it, to ensure that we have a society where liberty and justice for all is truly realized. And so I offer that up as at least kind of one vision that I think is important. But I actually think that the choice in this election has become even more stark. If I had to do another remix of that question, it would be this. Where do we go from here? Fascism or pushing our country up the mountain of becoming a truly just multiracial democracy? Now, the last part is a little bit longer, but I think we have to, you know, Describe it a little bit more. I wrote an article, and maybe some of you have seen it if you're on our list, that I didn't want to write. It actually really pained me to have to write this article. But I felt like it was my Christian duty, particularly as someone who tries to be someone that is committed to the prophetic tradition of the church, to speak truth to power, to really name this increasing danger that we see in the choices that we have in front of us in this election of a rising degree of fascism, 
of language that has been used in this campaign that is increasingly and more explicitly fascist. Now, fascist is not a word that I think most Americans necessarily fully understand. And I've been very reluctant to use it because I actually think it's a word that sometimes just further divides us. But sometimes we actually have to name the thing. And we have to name the thing that is being used as a tool to divide us and literally could help jeopardize so many of the freedoms that we hold dear, including our democracy that I think is increasingly fragile in this particular moment. And so, you know, as you, as you probably know, a lot of this was stemmed or uh, motivated by an interview that four-star former General John Kelly gave to the New York Times last week, where he, in much more explicit terms, not only talked about how former President Trump often described how he admired Hitler, but he was, you know, literally looked up fascism in real time in this interview. And as he was reflecting on his time as a chief of staff for almost two years with former President Trump, basically said, yes, I believe that Trump's behavior and his rhetoric satisfies this definition of fascism. Now, the Council of Foreign Relations defines fascism this way, a mass political movement that emphasizes extreme nationalism, militarism, and the supremacy of the nation over the individual. Now, there, we could certainly go, it's not meant to be a political science course, so I'm not gonna give you tons of other definitions, but I think that definition is helpful. And for a long time, I have been making the case that Trump has indeed exhibited many authoritarian tendencies. There's a thing called the authoritarian playbook that an organization called Protect Democracy has been uh, putting out for a number of years. And he's checked almost all the boxes, attacking the, the media, really trying to dehumanize his enemies, a commitment and willingness to question the integrity of our elections. He still has not conceded that he lost the last election, as we know. And so he has shown a lot of authoritarian tendencies. But where authoritarianism starts to move into fascism is in these two particular ways. Where I think he crossed the line the most is when, in the last couple of weeks, he has doubled down on statements that say he is willing and planning to use the military to go after his political enemies, which then he has named as the radical left, including people like Adam Schiff and people like Nancy Pelosi and others. That is fascism. He also, as we know, has become more and more grotesque and more and more say it, vile, in the ways in which he has dehumanized migrants in this country and has used language like migrants, undocumented immigrants, are, are, are poisoning the blood of our nation. Again, fascist language that other fascists around the world have used. And so, again, I, I kind of name this, I call it out with anguish in my heart because this is not certainly what any of us want to be doing. But the challenge, and this is why I think it's so important for Christians to, to be clear about this and to be naming it, talking about it, denouncing it, is that this kind of fascist language gives permission, not just for hate, but also potentially for violence. And if you look at what the Department of Homeland Security is saying, if you look at what many organizations, think tanks are saying, they are saying that we are on the precipice of an election that is filled with the greatest potential for political violence in a very long time. Now, I definitely didn't come here to just name all of the danger and threats and you know, have you leave depressed. <laughs> so I do believe that our faith gives us a foundation to stand upon. And before I kind of go into what I think our calling is in this moment, I do want to remind you of two texts that I have been reflecting on and leaning on in the midst of this moment of peril. One comes from 2 Timothy, where God, where, where, where uh, the Apostle Paul is inspired by God to say the words, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but instead God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. And I think leaning into that commitment to love, not an anemic love, but a fierce love, that also is committed to speaking the truth is really critical in this moment. The other is one of my favorite 
uh, text from the Old Testament from my favorite prophet, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40, where he says toward the end of that chapter, for they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. And as a runner, at least a former runner, I love this notion that even in the midst of a time of great uncertainty, a time of great stress, we, particularly in those times, need to continue to lean on the Lord. And that when we do, when we wait on God, when we hope in God, that God will renew our strength, right? Well, now is to mount up on wings as eagles. It's a very beautiful metaphor. So I want to kind of share really briefly three things that I think it's important that we embrace, that we commit ourselves to. Because one thing is going to be true. No matter who prevails in this election, we will continue to be a severely divided nation. And we have to find ways to try to heal some of that divide, bridge some of that divide, while not compromising some of our core faith commitments to issues of justice, which often include a particular commitment to protect the most vulnerable and the most marginalized in our midst. And so I am happy to talk about whatever policy issues are at the front of your mind and your spirit right now. We know there is so much at stake from immigration to reproductive rights to the economy to the horrific ongoing war in Gaza that is now spilled over into Lebanon to the climate crisis and so much more. But I think that underneath a lot of these real serious policy issues, we also have to find a way to bridge some of our divides. And so I wanted to share briefly how we as the church can serve this role of being a balm, a bridge, and a beacon. So first, the purpose of a balm is to heal wounds or to reduce pain. Prophet Jeremiah cries out, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? I think at the best, our church, our church is, play a role in both healing and addressing the root causes of people's pain and being able to address, directly meet, the, the, those, you know, meet some of the needs that people have. But we're also called to heal some of the wounds that are within the body itself. Since the early 2000s, pollsters have found that young people, in particular, predominantly perceive the church to be hypocritical, homophobic, and overly judgmental. Not exactly the best calling card for Jesus, right? They have suggested that if current trends continue, and this is actually based on Pew polling, the share of the U.S. population who identify as Christian will decrease from 64% in 2020 to between 35 and 50% in 2070, a much more dramatic decline. Now, of course, what many people, including young people, perceive the church to be isn't the full truth. We know that so many churches and ministries are on the front lines of serving their communities, including this one. And we know that we are offering examples of Christ's commitment to charity and service. But I believe that our commitment to both reconciliation and to justice are essential for how we rebrand the church moving forward. And that that matters in the context of not only how we are called to live out our faith, but whether our commitment to the Great Commission of making disciples of all nations actually has real impact and real resonance, particularly for those that feel alienated from the church or have been excluded from the church in various ways. And so this is a time to be a bomb. Now, bomb, being a bomb also requires truth-telling. And the challenge is that sometimes that truth-telling can exacerbate some of the divisions and tensions that we see in our midst. So we have to find ways to try to tell the truth that are rooted in a commitment to love rather than a commitment to purely shame those that we disagree with or a commitment that is primarily focused on trying to change their mind. And so, again, this kind of commitment to love is, is essential. The second, I'm going to go a little faster because I, 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 what I often do is, you know, I say I want to engage in dialogue, and then I burn up all my time through uh, my remarks. So I promise to not do that today. But secondly, I really do believe this is a time for the, the church to be a bridge. 
in the, in the context of toxic polarization, it's important to understand why it's toxic. So we've been divided throughout our history. It's ebbed and flowed. But the reason why it's so dangerous today is that it's become this vicious cycle. It's become self-perpetuating. We've crossed this threshold where, according to Pew polling, the majority of Democrats and Republicans in this country no longer just dis distrust each other and dislike each other, which is kind of bad enough. The majority say they actually have contempt for the other. And instead of wanting to persuade people that have a different political affiliation, they simply want to defeat them. That's a really dangerous place to be. And again, there's no simple cure. There's no magic bullet for that. But I believe that one way that we can help cure that is by having more of a shared sense of values and a shared language about the moral vision that we are trying to cast for the country. And as you know, I'm a little biased in this, re in this respect. I believe that the moral vision that animated the civil rights movement, the, the vision of the beloved community, could be that vision. Partly because it is not a left-right vision. It is not a Republican or Democrat vision. It is a vision that is grounded in our most sacred religious and civic values. And that is the kind of vision that we need right now to bridge some of the divides that we are seeing as a country and we're seeing within the church itself. And then third, I believe the church must be a beacon, not just to the world, but also to our own nation. Jesus calls us to be salt and light. Dr. King put it this way, that the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather it's the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, but never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Now, to become the conscious of the state, I think we need as Christians to develop some kind of guardrails to help to shape and guide how we engage in politics. I brought together a really diverse group of Christian leaders two summers ago because I was really worried about the state of our politics and the toxic polarization we were seeing. And we reflected together, and what we realized is that there are two extreme forces that are kind of pulling us as Christians in opposite directions. You have one force that is literally trying to weaponize the Christian faith and essentially align it with one political party and now one kind of allegiance to one leader. That is a form of idolatry. And I think it's important for us, and we can talk about this more in the Q&A, that we recognize that the religious right as a movement started as a creature of the political right. It literally was a deal between Jerry Falwell Jr., or Jerry Falwell Sr., sorry, and a political operative named Paul Warrick, who basically made an agreement to each other to try to convert white evangelicals into a political bloc. What was our first issue? It was not abortion, that came about six years later. It was to oppose the desegregation of Christian colleges and schools after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And so there have been ways in which the religious right is a movement that has now morphed, I would argue, into kind of a white Christian nationalist movement has become um, increasingly kind of separated from core theological principles and has increasingly become a ideological movement and not a religious movement. But the other extreme, and this is, I understand this temptation with many churches, is to say, look, all of this politics stuff is just corrupting. So our approach is to be apolitical. We're gonna kind of disengage from politics and that is gonna be the way that we're gonna cure the church. But the challenge in that is that we are literally then surrendering the responsibility of discipling people to Fox News or maybe to MSNBC or to whatever media source people trust. Following Jesus has profound social, political, and economic implications. If Jesus is Lord, which I deeply believe, that includes over our political lives. So I want the church to be engaged in much more courageous discipleship to try to help people have a series of biblically rooted principles that can ground them. And then of course, we will disagree, we should disagree on how to apply those biblical principles and values to the messiness of politics. And so what we did is we, we came up with a, a shared statement that we call a call to civic discipleship. And then it rejects these two extremes and says, we need to model a healthier form of Christian engagement in our politics that includes a commitment to a series of principles. Things like exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, 
of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do they sound like the things that are predominating in our politics today, right? When Jesus said, love our enemies, I don't think he was kidding. I don't think it was an optional thing. He literally wanted us to love our enemies, which I know is increasingly hard in our current environment. It's things like resisting us versus them thinking, resisting a zero-sum form of politics. It's a commitment to confront violence with nonviolence, to seek truth and discern it, to exercise prudence, to embrace a long-term view. And then we borrowed from a a Catholic document called Faithful Citizenship, where we include a number of principles that I found to be particularly useful. Things like to be engaged in politics, but never be used by politics. To be political, but to not be overly partisan. To be principled, but not overly ideological. And to be clear, but also civil. And the statement, if you can, I can direct you to it, kind of unpacks all of those commitments. But I believe in, the, in addition to those commitments, we still have a core commitment to be both pastoral and to be prophetic. And where I think that is most needed in this particular moment is around what should be a shared commitment across the Christian spectrum, which is a commitment to ensure that we protect the freedom to vote and that we protect our very democracy itself. Sojourners has been engaged and has been leading a campaign over the last number of election cycles called Face United to Save Democracy. It's got a big name. We believe that we needed and wanted to recreate the kind of civil rights coalition that was both multi-faith and multiracial and apply it to the current context where we have seen a concerted effort to undermine people's freedom to vote in many different states across the country, which was triggered primarily by the Supreme Court decision in 2013 of Shelby versus Holder that removed the pre-clearance provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. We argued then that if the Supreme Court made that decision, or after they did, that we would see a barrage of new laws passed across the country. They would erect new barriers, often targeted to make it more difficult for black and brown voters in particular to vote. But they also could disproportionately impact the elderly or young people and students. We have seen 400 bills that have been been attempted to pass all across 49 states in this country. Now, fortunately, many of them, most of them were actually defeated. But sadly, according to the Brennan Center, there are still, as of, and this is as of 2021, 14 states that have enacted 17 restrictive voting laws. And most of those states are in the South and the Midwest, Many of them are in the quote unquote battleground states like Georgia and Ohio and elsewhere. And so we developed a campaign that was rooted in that commitment I talked about earlier, a commitment to Imago Dei, because this is not a partisan or political issue. Voting is what lends our political system its credibility and its legitimacy. And when we deny people or make it more difficult for them to exercise their sacred freedom to vote, we then essentially are assaulting Imago Dei itself. And so we have been involved in voter education work, all nonpartisan. We have been building relationships with election uh, officials all the way up to the Secretary of State level. And we have now trained almost 1,000 poll chaplains who are going to be serving at vulnerable polling sites in 10 states. I'm actually going to be up in Philadelphia on Election Day doing this with our clergy and rabbis and others to ensure that we can try to prevent intimidation or, at worst, violence. And we can provide a welcoming presence at polling sites where it's needed the most. To me, that is Christians showing up to be a bridge, a balm, and a beacon. And so I am excited, anxious to kind of engage with you in conversation about whatever is on your hearts and minds as we go into this election. But I hope this framework, this kind of calling to be a balm, a beacon, and a bridge is helpful, not just in terms of how we think about the election, but how we show up in the days after the election because I think those days are gonna be equally important. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, it's a gift, I was mindful of this just as we were sitting down, how much of a gift it is for us just to, as a community to sit together in one space on a subject like this. You know, you come to church and you don't know, is it going to come up in the pulpit today or whatever? But this is a very intentional space on this 
subject. I'm going to actually ask just one, engage with you. I'm not, I'm not looking to you to answer all my, my questions, um, but I want to engage with you on something that I think might be beneficial for us, and then we'll open it up for your thoughts and your comments. So um, one thing that you said that captured me, you didn't say this today. Um, I heard you say it somewhere else that I thought was really, really important for us to hold is that the kingdom of God is not fully represented on any ballot. Just listen to that. The kingdom of God is not fully represented by any candidate on any, any ballot. And um, if you'll just hold that for a second, I, I found um, in the last year, um, just with all the wars that are going on in our uh, world and how much America is behind funding a lot of those wars, it's like the scales have fallen from my eyes. And now I watch candidates that are making appeals to moral values. And I look at that and I say, but you guys are killing so many people in the world, right? I, I look at um, Trump and I've got issues with Trump. And then I look at um, Kamala Harris and I am like, like the words that you say sound good, but I know what the Democratic Party is doing in all kinds of, all parts of the world. So my question is, how do we vote? It, it is true that being a good citizen is more than just voting, and but it is voting. We need to exercise that. But how do we vote faithfully when the options are out there are painfully divergent from what we believe the kingdom of God calls us to? So whoever we vote for, we are voting for an option that is faith, painfully divergent from what we believe the kingdom of God calls us to. So how do we wrestle with that? How do you wrestle with that? Yeah, it's no, a it's, it's, a really, it's a really important question. I think, you know, certainly this is even more important this election cycle among many, not just young people, but many young people that are having a really difficult time kind of making the case in themselves why they should vote, particularly in light of everything that's happened with the, the horrific war in Gaza and beyond. And, and, and yeah. I do believe we should vote. Right. The question is, how do you do How that? do you do it? Right. Well, but I, I don't think we can even jump over that because I think there are a lot of people that still need to be convinced to vote. And I think one of the dangers is a lot of people will stay at home, if you will, as a protest. Yeah. And I understand that impulse. But unfortunately, in the system that we have, if you do not vote, you are essentially endorsing the status quo or what you know, you're going to kind of endorse what ends up happening. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a quote that I love to share where he was kind of reflecting in the context of Nazi Germany that not to speak is actually to speak, not to act is actually a form of action. And I think that's also true with our voting. Mm -hmm. We can say that it's a protest vote, but ultimately in a, in a system dominated by two parties that's winner take all, you are essentially then reinforcing that whatever status quo happens after you vote. The way I look at it is, you know, I, as you shared, it's true. The kingdom of God is never on the ballot, right? And the candidates you choose are always going to be highly imperfect. Now, you know, sometimes they're less imperfect than others, right? But I think what makes this particular election different, and it's going to sound, as I'm saying this, like I'm offering an endorsement, which is not my intent. But if you have one candidate who literally refuses to play by the rules, and wants to change those rules, i.e. over time undermine, from my perspective, not just basing this on opinion or fear, I'm basing it on what he tried to do the last time and what he says he's gonna do the next time, then you as a citizen are gonna have a lot less ability to influence that administration, right? And you know, I understand people's cynicism. I, I am extremely frustrated that despite all of the protests that I spoke at and engaged in, all the ways that we sent letters to the administration, all the meetings I had with the White House, that by and large, we were not able to move the Biden administration around pursuing a ceasefire and then justice, kind of a lasting peace with justice. But I am very convinced that we're going to have a lot more ability to influence a Harris, Harris administration than we are a Trump administration based on what we've heard and seen. So I think that is kind of one way to, to look at it. The other is to, you know, again, understand that like, 
yeah, I mean, this is a very imperfect set of, a set of choices, but we have to consult our conscience and both decide what we think is gonna better align with our values and better align with where we think we can better most influence candidates in the future. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways that I have disagreed with the Biden administration. I don't think they've done nearly enough on addressing issues of poverty in this country. You know, we obviously, as I just said, very much disagreed on their approach to the Gaza war. And, you know, if we think about just the insane amount of military spending that we continue to spend with almost zero accountability, that's really kind of a, a a bipartisan commitment right now. <laughs> Both Republicans and Democrats do not really question our military spending and the way in which we are using that around the world. So, you know, I think that we have to reserve that right to critique, try to understand where, what, what kind of administration or Congress would we have most influence to try to bend toward the future we want to create. Yeah. And then we have to understand where is there real danger that is far beyond anything we have seen, which makes this a very unusual election in that sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to be clear, St. John's does not endorse any one candidate. Um, and so this is an honest conversation. So we can talk about um, these kinds of things in that context. But I did want to also, um, as I invite you to speak today, I want to keep the topic as much as we can on the intersection of our faith and our politics, okay? Because that's the, that's the idea here, is to bring those two into conversation. Um, we have uh, people joining us, many people joining us online today, and Jay is going to take uh, questions from the chat, so make sure to put your stuff in the chat there. Also, if you're joining us online, you might not see who's asking the question in the audience, but you will hear them because we have microphones uh, in, in hand. So just raise your hand. I'll call on you, and then we'll get you a microphone. So uh, let's go right here. Thank you. Just say your name and then... Uh, and Hi, I'm Beth Freer King. Thank you for coming today. Um, I have a question and also a quick share. Um, on my way to church this morning, I was finishing listening to the end of a story I highly recommend to everyone in the New York Times by a reporter named Eli Saslow. It's about a very long piece about the young man in Springfield, Illinois, uh, Springfield, Ohio, Aiden Clark, who was killed in a bus accident several years ago, school bus. That became a a, a huge political point because the man who was driving the car that hit the bus uh, was a legal Haitian immigrant, but it became fuel for um, uh, really terrible things, including uh, flyers that had racial epithets from the child's picture. That's how bad it got. My question to you is that kind of polarization by name neo-Nazi groups in Ohio, how does the church deal with that kind of thing? Because these parents now have been through not only the, the death of their son, an 11 year old, but having death threats against them. How do we go outside what I would assume is a group of people who are open to getting past that polarization into communities where there are a lot of people using that for their own political means. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, what has happened in Springfield is just horrific and it's um, indefensible. And I think, well, I'll answer your question two, two ways. One, I think it has shown the degree to which, sadly, tragically, a degree of uh, cruelty and a degree of just outright lying has become normalized in our in our politics. Um, that you know situation was not really amplified into a national crisis that then upended the community of Springfield until J.D. Vance amplified it knowing that it had been debunked and then you know, Trump picked it up, et cetera. And so even despite Governor DeWine, who's a Republican saying this is not true, and then the mayor saying this is not true, you still have candidates for president and vice president that are promulgating a vile racist lie. That's where we are. And I think we have to call it out in that way, right? Again, from a spirit of love, but if you really love 
someone you want to actually protect them. I don't know, you know, maybe we've forgotten thou shalt not bear false witness as one of the commandments. So that's on the political side. Then on, on the kind of more spiritual church side, I think it's really important, and I have seen evidence of this, that we come alongside and really try to show solidarity and, and support and protection to that community, particularly Haitians in that community. And I know that there are churches that are doing that, right? Um, and I, I haven't necessarily followed as closely as I would like, like which church leaders have kind of spoken out in the way that I think they should, but I know many, many have. So I think those are kind of two really critical ways um, but I mean, I just feel like there are things that used to be disqualifying in our politics that just are no longer disqualifying. And so we have to grapple with that as a country because that's not gonna go away even if a certain outcome happens in the, in the election. We're still gonna have people that are swayed by that degree of fear and hatred and that degree of disinformation. You're right, they are legal immigrants that are here on temporary protective status we could have a much more enlightened civil conversation about whether we should continue that policy in a new administration. But instead we are debating or arguing about whether patient immigrants that are here legally are eating cats and dogs. Thank or geese, you. correct. Becky, I saw your hand up and we're gonna to go to Becky and then we'll, we'll come to you, um, Felix. Hi, um, my name's Becky. This is my question. Um, both sides, if we wanna talk about the division, both sides feel with their heart and mind and soul that the salvation of the country mm. is one candidate. So I really appreciated you identifying the division as this lack of trust and pure contempt. My question is more because my fear is as much after the election, no matter who or what, how to do this bomb, bridge, and sorry if I forget, beacon. beacon. Yeah. Because I, and I think it speaks to the call for forgiveness and, um, and reconnection anywhere. But how do you approach that clear division when there is no trust, there's pure contempt, and there doesn't seem like really a bridge to the other side, whichever way we land? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. So I want to clarify one thing, and then I'll get to your question. I certainly don't see a Harris administration as the kind of road to salvation for this country. What I think is that this is a moment where we have to defend democracy so we can actually transform it. And that there's gonna be a huge amount of work to do with the Harris administration to kind of get us on a much better track. And then, you know, we'll go into all the details about what that looks like now, but just wanna kind of clarify that. You're right, um, there's a lot that we have to do. And I'm really inspired by some of the work of a number of initiatives, both within the church and then broader than the church. So one that's outside of the church, although it's working with many churches, is called Braver Angels, where they're bringing together Republicans and Democrats, or self-identifying Republicans and Democrats, and really creating community, creating a relationships between them, and helping to model the kind of civil dialogue that is really missing in our larger body politic right now. And they've created chapters all around the country. So you could look up Braver Angels and um, you know, get involved in their work. There's a number of things that are happening in the church. So there's an initiative that uh, you've heard of Russell Moore and David French, who are two conservatives, um, co-created called um, the After Party, where they're trying to work with primarily evangelical churches, although a lot of the tools they've created could also be beneficial to mainline churches, about how to kind of bridge some of these divides within a church and create provide a kind of a tool set that fosters greater civility, curiosity, kind of tough love, and a, a, you know, a willingness to center our core identity in Christ, which should supersede any other you know, label that we have for ourselves or affiliation that we have for ourselves, including our, par our partisan loyalties and affiliations. Um, Sojourners is work, we got a grant from the Lilly Endowment to develop a whole series of tools and resources for churches 
that are really trying to move them from polarization to unity. So I'm excited we won't necessarily have those ready until probably the spring, but I'm really excited that we're gonna be offering a lot more to churches. So there, there are like a lot of concrete things that are out there. I think, unfortunately, a lot of these are not at scale. So, you know, <laughs> you probably haven't heard of many of them, um, but we need more things like that because, and then I guess the last thing I'll just mention is that one of the things that I think is making extremism much more attractive and palatable is there are a lot of people, particularly young people, that are really, really searching for greater belonging and significance and who feel you know, very alienated, feel very frustrated, that can easily turn to anger. And I'm not just saying this, this is what you know, Department of Homeland Security is saying. And so you know, the, the good news from my perspective is that churches are designed to provide a lot of that. Like we are designed to kind of show what the beloved community could look like in our churches. Um, but it probably requires that we break out of some of our comfort zones and try to reach more of those, those people that may not be active in our churches today. So I think that's another piece of this that is, is really critical. Thank you. I'm going to take one question from a teen, uh, Felix, and then we're going to go to a question online. Go ahead, Felix. Uh, yeah, I'm Felix. Uh, my question is more about uh, the influence that we've seen from pop culture in this election. For example, I know there are many... At the end of the Trump administration, there were many rappers that were pardoned by him who got all of their criminal charges that they were facing just completely dropped. And it and what this led to and what has been seen in a lot of uh, cities and many of the swing states, for example, Philadelphia, there has been a noticeable amount of support for him from the young black community because of this. So my question is, what can we do to help people? sort of understand or break free from this sort of association with between pop culture and the election and sort of think about the difference of voting because you're that because one person is supporting your favorite pop culture star or voting be for what you truly think is best wow yeah thank you that's a thank great you, great question um well two things one, one is that the, the, the reasons that I hear the most from some of the you know younger black men in particular that I'm in conversation with or just kind of watching you know other ways in which this is playing out is is that issue you just named that he he did pardon a number of, of black rappers. It's also the stimmy checks. That's what I hear oftentimes that he gave me money, put money in my pocket, right? And clearly that was done in the context of the pandemic. That was done with bipartisan support. It was you know, short-lived right? and was you know, very specific to that, that moment, though you know, certainly former President Trump took, took credit for it. I think, one, on criminal justice, we need to remind people that former President Trump was the one that put out an ad in the New York Times around the Central Park Five. And I know that you know, they spoke at the Democratic National Convention. There's been more visibility around this. But he has a pretty... I would argue, heinous record when it comes to issues of criminal justice, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Black community. Um, his response after all of the horrific killings in 2020 was certainly not, in my opinion, responsible or showing good leadership. So, you know, I, unfortunately, there's almost like this kind of amnesia that I think some folks are suffering from or nostalgia even. And we have to kind of remind them what, it, what actually happened. What did he actually do? What has he said he's going he's gonna to do as president? The other part of it is that, and just you know, really remind folks that, you know, fine, you, you, you certainly can listen to, to pop stars and we can you know, line up all the pop stars that have you know, publicly endorsed Harris. But at the end of the day, this is something that you need to kind of do some of your own homework about, hopefully, and really consult your conscience around. Don't just kind of follow the whims of your favorite rapper or pop star, et cetera. Um, so I think just kind of encouraging people to, to think a little bit deeper than that is really important. Um, and then getting people into the actual record of the various candidates and the you know, very stark contrast between them. You know, um, before we go here, I want to say this word amnesia yeah. is so like it's so powerful right now. I think of it like when, you know, uh, Kamala Harris is like Dick Cheney has, 
you know, endorsed my campaign. And everyone's like, yeah, you know, it's like, we're like amnesia, right? This is the, these are the pieces that are so important for us. Um, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is from Emily Morrison online. Can you address the divide and polarization between Christians themselves, both sides of whom feel they are closer to Jesus's vision for our country and the world, whether progressive or conservative, both feel they are right with God? Good question. This is going to be our last question, and then I'm going to say a prayer. Okay. Yeah, it is a great question, and um, it's a tough one. I mean, I one, I, I never want or you know certainly try not to question the authenticity of someone's faith. I will critique where I feel like some of the things they're saying and doing may cross a line of idolatry or be heretical or not consistent with my understanding of Christian values, but certainly not my place and any of our place to question someone's authentic Christian faith, right? There are ways in which there are certainly many people that are more on the extreme right really believe and are motivated by their Christian faith to vote for Donald Trump. And, you know, there, there are some forms of that that literally have like, this that happened when he was first elected, have declared him a kind of King Cyrus figure, that God is anointing and using someone that they know is amoral and corrupt, like King Cyrus, to then do God's will. And again, I've got a very, very poor, dangerous reading of how God works and of scripture itself. So I think those kind of the kind of things that we do need to challenge. But I, I very try to be really clear that there is a big distinction between the kind of most extreme forms of white Christian nationalism and those Christians that have conservative values yeah. and that care deeply about abortion or care deeply about traditional marriage. And we cannot conflate these two things. We cannot just say, because you have more conservative values, you are therefore a Christian nationalist, even if they might be highly correlated with each other. And so I think that we've got to be really clear about that. And that, you know, this, you know, using a, a phrase that kind of made my predecessor, Jim Wallace, more famous, God truly is not a Republican or a Democrat, right? And I just think we have to say that. We have to embrace that. And while, you know, I do believe that we serve a God of justice and, you know, the vision that I'm trying to put forward through the beloved community is, you know, a vision that I think is consistent with my understanding of kind of God's priorities and of my best attempt to apply my faith to politics. I also recognize that there's a need for a lot more civil conversation about how we do this. And sometimes it, there's a need for compromise. And you know, that kind of gets viewed as a negative word, but there is no way in a democracy that you cannot embrace at times compromise. And some of the issues that we care about, we might have to find some compromise in order to move them forward. I have real issues with some aspects of the immigration deal that was reached um, a number of months ago, about, well, about six months ago, that then President Trump kind of tanked, right? Because he didn't think it was going to be helpful for the election. And at the same time, it was a compromise that I actually think would help to improve our asylum system and would temporarily kind of close the border or at least restrict the flows on the border that then could be improved over time with our, with our, with our pressure. So, you know, again, it certainly wouldn't be my first choice, but I think it would have made, done some good and, and it would have been helpful. So those are some of, things, some of the things that I think we should be thinking about. And ultimately, like, I want to see the church become that place where people of very different political perspectives and persuasions can actually not just coexist, but can be in deep fellowship with each other. Like that to me is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. And, you know, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. But I think it's not just possible, it's necessary. So I hope that we can find ways to co-create that going forward. Um, Adam, you just talked about compromise, which brings me back to my original question that I asked in the beginning. We are already compromising. When we vote for any of these candidates, when it comes to the kingdom of God, we are already compromising. Yeah. And so that's a really interesting idea is that we can maybe explore what the spirituality of compromise looks like. 
living in a secular state. So that's something um, for us. I also really appreciate a comment you made earlier, which I found um, with some direction for me, we have to protect democracy so that we can have the opportunity to change it. And I appreciate that. Um, I wanna do, before we uh, walk out of here, I wanna ask us to sit in silence together for just one minute. And I wanna ask you if you will offer your um, best prayers for the healing of this country. Let's not, let's not pray right now that one candidate wins and the other loses. Let's not do that. Let's pray for the spirit of God to permeate all of our hearts and the hearts of all people in this community and this nation that we might grow in wisdom. I want you to just hear God's voice right now in our midst saying, I am with you. It's gonna be okay. Just let the, the hugeness of a God of good and justice hold you. In your holy name, we pray, O oh Lord. Amen. Friends, let's thank Adam. Thank you. Friends, um, I do just want to make an announcement. On election day, uh, we're going to have the church open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I'm going to be sending out a notice for volunteers who want to um, just commit to being there for one hour um, at each of those hours. And then we're going to have a, just a short liturgy at the top of every hour, led by parishioners, um, just like five, ten minutes. And then you can come sit in silence. You know, you'll know at the top of every hour there's some structure. Uh, and you can have this space uh, in our uh, church as long as you need it on election day. So um, please take advantage of that. You'll hear more about that. Thanks to everyone for coming. Blessings. Thank you.